Hello and welcome back. So this was initially going to be uh, a video designed to talk people off the ledge when it comes to trades. I've been getting a lot of, hey, what do you think of this trade in my comments section? And there's a lot of variables that go into a good trade. So I wanted to kind of break it down and give you advice for how to structure your trades to maximize results. But then, this afternoon, the news came out that Zach Wierenski will be done for the remainder of the season. And as a perfect corollary to the trade discussion, I will also cover how you can replace Wierenski long term if you own him. So, let's get into it. To start off, why should you make a trade in fantasy? Have you asked that question before, uh, before you threw that trade out there? A lot of people don't really know why they're making a trade, and that is troubling, and we'll cover that in a moment. When should you make a trade? Are there optimal times to pull the trigger? Uh, what should you look for in terms of buy low and sell high, etc.? And last but not least, we will cover how the hell you replace Zach Wierenski. So let's dive right in. Let's start with why you shouldn't make a trade. So first off, don't just make a trade to make a trade. This almost never works out. It shows a lack of patience and everyone else in your league will know that you're desperate and trying to get the best of you. Um, there's always one guy in every league who likes to wheel and deal. And I can speak from experience. I always try to fleece that guy knowing that he'll take a deal just for the sake of the excitement. Don't be that guy in my league. The league champion hasn't made a single trade over the last three years. And there's been a couple different champions. Uh, and only one of the top three teams over that span has made any trades at all. Uh, and that trade involved, uh, kind of a mistake on the part of the other person who was trading with him. Uh, they ac accidentally didn't realize that they were giving up Markstrom last year. So uh, that ended up vaulting him into the top three. But other than that, there haven't been any trades in the top three uh, over the last three seasons in my league. And it's likely the same case in your leagues as well. Um, you can check that on Yahoo if you want the confirmation on that. Number two, your players aren't performing. Maybe you drafted Kyle Connor, Thatcher Demko, Roman Yossi, or someone similar uh, you got them in the top six rounds and you just aren't seeing the results yet. Your team is struggling and you want to trade these guys to help you out. But you absolutely shouldn't do this because you're selling from a position of weakness and you're selling low on your top assets. You should try to do the opposite and sell high on assets that are overperforming, not sell low on the top picks that are struggling. And as rough as it feels in the moment, you do have to try to use some patience and wait for these guys to turn it around. And if you'll remember in some of the goaltending videos that I've, I've talked about, I had Thatcher Demko last year. I tried to wait as long as I could. I ended up dropping him to the waiver wire because I couldn't find a trade partner. And then immediately after that, he had a 946 save percentage in the month of December, 7-2 record, and was goaltender of the month. So take it from me. Don't make that mistake. Number three, you're in last place. If you are, this is definitely worrying. And the thought process needs to be this. You don't need to climb from last to first. You just need to get into the playoffs by the end of the year. You're building your team for head-to-head -head matchups in the playoffs, and you need to keep that front and center as you navigate the season. So then, why should you make a trade? Uh, I've mentioned this in previous videos, but your fantasy team is essentially an engine, and that engine needs to be powerful enough to get you over the finish line at the end of the season and win the race. But your, if your engine isn't running properly, you need to correctly identify the problem and fix that specific part. You don't start stripping it down to the block and rebuilding it. If you're in a category league and you notice you're not getting enough assists but have plenty of goal scorers, maybe take one of those goal scorers and trade for an assist heavy guy. So maybe in that case, uh, if you have Pasternak and you need some more assists, maybe trade Pasternak for Panarin. Something like that, where you're not trading... Uh, you know, high value for low value. You're kind of trading guys that are on the same plane, but you're getting a different category coverage. Or maybe you could take a guy with high name value, but lower production and try to trade him for the opposite. So maybe uh, line a who has really high name, uh, name value, and he's typically a goal scorer, but he's been in and out of the lineup due to injury. And maybe you can try to parlay that into a Jesper Bratt or somebody with less name value who's performing really well right now. These types of moves address a specific need for your team and are more strategic and more of a complement to your draft strategy as opposed to trying to take everything down to the studs and rebuild from the ground up. Now, another reason to make a trade is that you have too many players on the same team and they're limiting your roster flexibility. For example, Isaiah in the Data Draft Discord group has the entire top line in Boston. Now, this is a great thing to have because they're all producing. Boston's playing really well right now. Uh, but they all obviously play the same nights and they're all off on the same nights. So on a light week where maybe Boston only plays two times, his entire team will suffer. So making a trade in this case 
is still from a position of strength. It still addresses a team need, which is positional flexibility, and it will likely add much needed diversification in case Boston starts slumping. Now, the other reason you should make a deal is when you pick up a guy or two off waivers and they are red hot, but you aren't 100% sure that they're going to keep this up for the entire season and you want to sell high on that player and use it to pick up a guy who's typically more reliable and more productive, but maybe isn't off to the best start. So this is a great example of value transfer, not unlike buying a stock, watching it pump, and then cashing those profits out into something safer and less volatile like a dividend stock or something. For example of this phenomenon, let's take a look at a trade that I recently made in the THHL league. So this is a trade that's been accepted, just waiting to make sure that the league doesn't veto it. But what I've done with this deal is both of what you saw on the previous screen. I have had an issue with depth goaltending since the draft, and this also goes back several years as well, struggling to find the complement to my G1. Um, that's my biggest weakness in fantasy, and it's a part of this data draft strategy because I keep pushing goaltenders back in the draft, and I've ex explained many times why you do that. Um, but this is where I need to have a little bit more goaltending depth. And before this trade, I picked up Jordan Bennington off of waivers, and my goalies at that point were Jari, Bennington, and Spencer Knight. But with this deal, I add one of my elite G1s from the goalie targets video, UC Soros, and I'll come back to that in just a second. But the other thing I did was take three players, all of whom I picked up off of waivers, and I've parlayed that value that they've accumulated into Soros, who was picked in the third round, 35th overall, and Nick Ehlers, who was a sixth round pick, 62nd overall. So Soros is off to a rough start, and Ehlers has been injured since the third game of the year, which is why Sterling Slapshots wasn't happy about, uh, you know, that's why he wasn't happy about these two players and why he currently sits in last place. But what happened is Sterling Slapshots did what I advised you don't do. He sold low on players that he drafted high, and he panicked and made a deal from a position of weakness to try to get out of 12th place. So I'm doing what I advised you all to do, deal from a position of strength, and transfer value from waiver pickups to guys with better longer-term outlooks. As it stands today, Goss Despair has dropped from the mid-40s to 99th overall and continues to drop game by game. Kubalik is off to a great start. He could potentially keep this up. That Detroit power play looks really good right now. But wingers are available on the wire until Ehlers comes back from injury. And when healthy, I do think Ehlers is a better wing option. When it comes to Soros, a lot of people are panicking about him and several other Predators players. So let's quickly take a look at why I think this is a nice buy low opportunity. As I mentioned in the early season goalie trends video, you ideally like to have a goalie playing behind a team that doesn't give up a ton of high danger chances. And in that line of thought, Nashville is 10th best in the league at suppressing high danger chances, only giving up 26 goals on 74 high danger chances thus far in the season. And Soros is right around even in terms of high danger differential, meaning the amount he's supposed to stop versus what he actually does. So he's not playing particularly good or particularly bad in terms of high danger chances. Um, he's been letting in what he should be given the quality of the chance. And if you're wondering about a team and whether or not they can come back from a poor start, uh, maybe St. Louis, Pittsburgh, Nashville, etc., you can look at these kind of metrics to get a better sense of what is actually going on. You'll typically be able to evaluate, evaluate personnel just based on your own knowledge of the teams, and all three of those teams should be performing better based on their talent level, so why aren't they? Remember, you can access all of these charts and visualizations in the Patreon link in the description below, and we will come back to this chart in just a second. But in terms of Soros, he's third best in the league right now at low danger chances, which means he's not giving up easy goals. But his main weakness right now is medium danger chances, where he's eighth worst. And Nashville is fourth worst in the league at giving up 284 medium danger shots. And using the eye test, to me, it looks like Nashville is just turning pucks over way too much in their own end, and that is something that you can fix with coaching, unlike personnel. So the reason why I'm still pretty high on Soros and Nashville in general, they do have the pieces to be a good defensive team, they are suppressing high danger chances, and let's not forget that they are still in that window after a return from Europe. So in the Global Series video I did a few weeks ago, I showed you that teams usually go 4, 5, and 1, or around that level uh, after they return from Europe, but they usually start to play closer to what they're expected to after that. So after returning from Europe, the Preds went 0-4-1 in their next five, and since then, they or since you know since they came back from Europe in general, they're 3-8-1 from then until today. 
So I also mentioned in that video that teams usually go up or down two or three spots in the standings from where they were the previous season. And last year, Nashville was 16th and made the playoffs. This year, they're currently 26th, and I would bank on a return to the mean from here, which means they'll have to play well above 500 to get there, and I will probably benefit from that with Soros. So this is the type of thought process that will help you evaluate trades and make better data-informed decisions when it comes to improving your team. So compare that with looking for a player who is hot right now and trading for him because he's hot, and you're essentially falling into the hot hand fallacy trap. So in gambling, the hot hand fallacy occurs when gamblers think that a winning streak is more likely to continue because it's been happening in the past. And this is often not the case. Instead, what I advise you to do is look at the difference between what should be happening and what is currently happening. Find the greatest divergence, confirm that with the eye test, and then try to target players from those teams. So who has a significant divergence right now? So let's go back and take a look at that high danger chances chart. Now what you're looking at here is high danger shots against in orange and high danger goals given up in blue. And what you see on the right are teams who are playing well defensively. So here you'll see St. Louis, Minnesota, and Nashville all playing well defensively, yet Soros, Flurry, and Bennington are all underperforming as we saw in the Goalie Trends video last week. These, to me, represent nice buy-low opportunities as all of these goalies were likely picked in the 4th to the 6th rounds and they're underperforming but their underperformance is potentially fixable because of the strength of their team defense. Does this mean that they're a lock to start improving? No, but they're a better buy low opportunity than a guy like Jack Campbell, as you see Edmonton third worst in high danger chances against and leading the league in high danger goals against by a pretty wide margin. So this type of analysis works for goalies, but if you're curious about forwards or defensemen, I'd encourage you to watch last week's early season player trends videos to get more insight on how to spot trends before they happen when it comes to players. Now, when should you make a trade? Timing a trade isn't necessarily as important as the thought process that goes into it, but timing trades properly can help you add value to your end. So for example, in that trade uh, that I just made, I picked up Ehlers, who's on IR right now. If he were playing, he'd likely be putting up between 0.8 and 1 point per game average and would be more valuable than he is right now, especially if someone is only looking at the raw numbers from this year to, to try to determine his value. So I can make this deal and stream wingers from now until then, and who knows, maybe I'll get another Kubalik that gets hot and I can flip him later on. But worst case scenario, I struggle a little bit until he returns from injury and I have a stronger team for the playoff push and for playoff head-to-head matchups. As I mentioned before, it's a great time to make a trade when waiver options uh, is one of the top three stars of the week or when you know he's top 50 in fantasy or just hot in general. So if you pick up a guy off waivers and all of a sudden the NHL is featuring him on their website or featuring him on their Instagram page or whatever, that's a great time to sell high because everybody's now familiar with that player. They now know that that name is you know performing well in fantasy and you could potentially cash in on that value. And sure, you could hold on to the player if you believe in them long term, But if you don't, you do want to sell high when there's league-wide buzz for that player as that will help you maximize value. And this brings me to a more immediate concern for many teams right now, which is when you get awful injury news like what we just got for Zach Wierenski, who will be out the remainder of the season with a shoulder injury. So all day long, the people in our Data Draft Discord group have been like vultures circling around a dead carcass, trying to uh, pry players away from whoever has Wierenski in their league. So they're offering a D-man in exchange for a better quality forward trying to quote-unquote help the Wierenski owner fill that roster spot while adding value to their team. So you could look at this from both perspectives. If you see this happen, you could do the same and try to offer up a defenseman that fills that owner's needs. Or if you own Wierenski, you need to think about it the opposite way. Don't take a low ball offer just to plug a hole for the short term. Instead, look at what you can do to replace Wierenski off the wire and evaluate trades on a team need basis. So when it comes to Wierenski, you'll need to replace three categories, goals, shots, and blocks. And it's relatively easy to find a blocks guy that will actually be way better than Wierenski in that category. But what may be the hardest to find is shots and goals. So in terms of shots, the top available guys are probably Noah Hannafin and Ben Sherratt. You can see their overall stats below. 
Wierenski was averaging 3.15 shots per game thus far this season. Hannafin is averaging about 3 shots per game, and Sherratt is about 2.2 shots per game, but a higher overall Yahoo rank and a lower ownership percentage. So that may factor into your decision. If you're if you're in a league that's uh, you know 14, 16 team league, you may have to go for a guy like Sherratt to replace that shot volume. Now, goals will be very difficult to replace, but there are a few options with three goals on the year, but none of them are necessarily reliable goal scorers. So let's take a look at an analysis project I did for the preseason. Now, what you see on the right are defenseman goal per game leaders from last year, and this is the analysis I was looking at when I was hyping up Eric Carlson before the season started, and that's paid off for everyone who took that advice. So you'll notice two spots above Eric Carlson is Adam Boquist, who had 11 goals on the year and was on pace for 17 over an 82-game season. In addition to this, he will likely quarterback that Columbus power play now that Wierenski's out. The issue right now is that Boquist is out with a broken foot that he suffered on October 25th, and he was literally just placed on long-term injured reserve this afternoon. So that can be applied retroactively, and his original timeline was six weeks, and that would put him coming back around December 6th. So about a month away. Now, as I mentioned before, if you want to try to add value, try to trade for him while he's on IR, or you could pick him up off waivers if he's there and stash him on the IR for when he returns, because he will slot into that number one uh, power play unit in Columbus. If you'd rather go a different option, you could try to find a trade for Shane Gostaspair, who's also on this list. Um, He's been trending down a little bit, but he's still the power play quarterback in Arizona. He has four goals in 13 games for the Coyotes. Uh, And he's probably, I mean, he's getting more owned up, but as he starts to cool off a little bit, maybe he becomes a little bit more available on the waiver wire. Now, you also see Dmitry Orloff here. Um, He's day-to-day right now, zero goals, five assists on the year, but only 33% owned. And he is capable of scoring goals, as you can see on the right. Uh, Washington hasn't been healthy. They're getting healthier by the day, though. And maybe you could grab him before the goals start to come. Now, you also see Carson Soucy there. Uh, If you're in a deeper league, he's only 5% owned, one goal, three assists, 17 shots, 37 hits, and 15 blocks on the year. Uh, Seattle's playing much better as of late, and that could be some nice exposure. But the play that might actually be able to replace Wierenski the best in terms of a one-for-one would be trying to make a deal for Jacob Chikrin. Currently, he's 42% owned, so he may not be available on the wire in most leagues. But if you just lost Wierenski, this could be a great idea. So with Chikrin, he's uh, on October 27th, Bill Armstrong said that he faced a setback recovering from his wrist injury and that he was still considered week to week. So that was two weeks ago, and maybe he's, you know, two to four weeks away from returning. Um, But the other thing to consider is the likelihood that he gets traded to a contending team. And that trade chatter has died down a bit, which may be the perfect time to sneak in and grab him in a trade. This is the kind of stuff I was talking about with the timing of a trade. Get him right now while nobody's talking about him. If you wait until he comes back from the the injury and the trade chatter starts to pick up, you likely have to pay more to get him. So now would be the time to buy on him. If you look at his numbers from last year, they aren't great. But the shot volume is still there, and the blocks is also comparable to Wierenski. If you look at his last full season in 2021, that was a 56-game season, but he played all of them. He put up, uh, uh, he was on pace for 26 goals over an 82 game season and on par with Wierenski's best season, which was a .31 goal per game as well. The shot numbers are almost identical and the power play production is actually better than Wierenski's. So, you know, the blocks numbers are pretty much where Wierenski is, a little bit better than that. Um, And normally Chikrin would be a riskier file because of the injury history and the uncertainty surrounding his trade destination. But since you just lost Wierenski, you probably need to accept that risk and take the best available option. And he's probably that for you right now. So to summarize all of this, don't make a trade just because you're bored. It's a sign of weakness and you won't win a championship. Don't make a trade just because guys you drafted high haven't gotten going yet. You may drop them and you may live to regret it like I did with Demko last year. Don't throw a Hail Mary pass because you're in last place and you're getting desperate. You're bargaining from a position of weakness, not strength. Do make a trade when you're looking at your team or your engine and a certain part isn't performing how it should and you want to fix that specific issue. Look to trade to add positional or team flexibility to allow for more games played or starts. And try to trade waiver guys who are hot and getting a lot of league-wide buzz. Try to transfer that value into a better, longer-term option. 
So that's going to do it for this video. If you have any questions, feel free to leave them in the comments section below. Don't forget to follow me on Instagram at data underscore draft for quicker breaking news, players that are hot, schedule plays, etc. Um, a lot of the stuff that would take me too much time to do a full YouTube breakdown gets put up on the Instagram. Um, you can see that right down here. This is uh, just I just started this literally a couple days ago, so we're trying to build it uh, from the ground up. So I would appreciate any help with that. Um, but if you made it to the end of this video, I want to thank you for sticking with it, and I will see you in the next one.